Now, our subject tonight is a vital one, the sin that God cannot forgive. It would be wrong for me at the end of this series of meetings together. We have been talking about the will of God, haven't we, and about the Word of God. The Word of God isn't something just that we put up here in our heads. It's got to be written in our hearts or it's no value. And so I think it's appropriate that at this last meeting, that at the end of my message that I will make, we will have a little consecration service together. Don't you think that would be in order? I think it would be. Now about this unpardonable sin. Some folk have thought, well, it can't be very important because Jesus only mentioned it once. Well, that is not the truth. He only called the unpardonable sin the unpardonable sin. He only called that he only called by that name once. But as we're going to see tonight, the unpardonable sin is all the way through the Bible. It's talked about everywhere. And we're going to see that. Now tonight's subject is a solemn one because the destiny of everybody in this room remains on this point. The unpardonable sin is not something that is committed only by a few very terrible, terrible people. As a matter of fact, when our Lord comes, everybody in the world will have committed the unpardonable sin, except the elect. In a very real sense, the only reason why men are lost is over this sin. Only reason is on the unpardonable sin. So it isn't something that's limited to somebody that's done some terrible, heinous action. Something that just makes your blood curl. How terrible. No, it doesn't come out that way, as you read here in the Bible. It can even be religious, as we're going to take note. Now, why should we be interested in a topic of this nature, anyway? First of all, there are a lot of people that are anxious about it. They are afraid that by some ill-advised word, by some uh, haphazard action, that they do the thing or say the thing that God can't forgive. And we need to clear that up, don't we? That it doesn't work that way. So we need to have some comfort here. It only shows how important it is and why people are anxious to understand it in order that they might steer, steer clear of it. And so let's get into it tonight. I'm intending that this message should be a message of encouragement as well as a message of warning, and it certainly is both of those. The time that Jesus mentioned, the sin that is beyond forgiveness, is recorded in the 12th chapter of Matthew, verses 31 and 32, and I read as follows. Jesus is speaking. Wherefore I say to you, that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. I had a man come to me one time and he said, Mr. Hoffman, surely this unpardonable sin just has to be murder. After all, a man may tell a lie and, and go and say, look, I, I didn't tell you the story right. This is the truth. In other words, you can change. You can turn around on a lie. Uh, a man can uh, steal something and yet he can go back and say, look, I stole it. Here's the money. Here's the object. I'm giving it back, my conscience has got me. Uh, you can make stealing right. You can make lying right, but when you take a man's life, this you can't, it's done, you can't put it back. Surely the unpardonable sin has got to be murder. Well, he made a lot of sense there, you know what I mean? He'd, it showed that he'd been thinking, but the unpardonable sin is not murder. 
because we have record here in the Bible, I can assure you that there will be people who have murdered other people that will go into the kingdom of God. And one of them, his name is Moses. Because Moses killed an Egyptian in a fit of temper and he buried him in the sand. And yet we know, we know that Moses has already been resurrected from the dead and is with our Lord in heaven itself. Now, let's take another one. David was called a man after God's own heart. Yet he was a murderer. And we'll go into this a little bit more tonight. He killed a man and took his wife because he wanted her. In order to get his wife, had the man slain. And yet David will be in God's kingdom. So we know positively, on the basis of the internal evidence of the Bible, that the unpardonable sin is not murder because murderers will go in. God can forgive murder. He certainly can. Then what is this sin? Well, let's examine the words that Jesus used. Uh, the, he said, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. There's nothing that anybody in this room tonight have done, has done, that God can't forgive. Nothing that you've done that he can't forgive if you'll confess. The problem, you see, lies in the confession. We'll look into that, too. The unpardonable sin is not some ill-advised word that slips out and you say, oh, I've done it. It isn't that. It's not an oath. It's not this or that, a lot of things that men think. Then what is the unpardonable sin? There is nothing that a man does with his hands or says with his lips that God can't forgive. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. And that's one of the most comforting things in all the Word of God, isn't it now? Nothing that Jesus can't forgive. Now let's do some simple reasoning together. The Spirit of God is in the heart, isn't he? He's in the middle of us. Comes into our lives. The unpardonable sin is something that happens inside a person because the Holy Spirit is inside. The unpardonable sin is not something you do. It becomes what you are, as we're going to note. No one is going to come along and knock on your door and say, I have a warrant for your arrest. You've committed the unpardonable sin. There isn't going to be any scandal sheet come out and say, man commits the unpardonable sin. No, the Holy Spirit is inside, isn't he? And the sin against the Holy Spirit is internally committed. It's a quiet kind of sin that happens inside a, per a person. A perfectly respectable sin that doesn't cause any eyebrows to be raised. A sin that can be committed right in church. And nobody will even look at you the second time. The man in the next pew may be none the wiser. It happens inside a heart. It is not an action. It is a condition that is brought about within the life by continually refusing to follow the leading of the Spirit of God. And if you won't follow, then you remain behind and he walks off and leaves you because you don't follow. And by that time, we don't hear his voice anymore because the voice of the Holy Spirit is silent in the heart until you don't feel anything. You are, as what the Apostle Paul said, past feeling. I don't feel anything wrong anymore. Well, let's look at it. What is this sin beyond forgiveness? I, I'm going to submit to you that the easiest way to understand it is really not so much by a definition as it is by looking into the lives of the people who did it and see how they did it. Perhaps it is best understood by illustration then. Hmm? And we're also going to look into the life of a man who almost did it. 
and why he almost did it and how he escaped it. You see, we have the Bible here, and this is the guidebook of the Christian. We have in this book the stories of people, human beings, just like ourselves, with all of our weaknesses, all of our foibles. Why do you think these stories are in the Bible? Just to amuse the children? God forbid. These stories are in the Bible that we might look at them and say, there is a man. And we might see within that man's life and within his experience, we might see him as a mirror in which we might see our own reflection. And by seeing our own reflection in his experience, that we might know what to do or what not to do. So there's a lot of stories here. And yet, the Bible is not a, just a collection of storybooks to amuse people. It's not a plot for some television drama. But rather that we might see in the mirror of the Word of God, see ourselves and say, oh, oh I'm almost doing the same thing. I better turn the other way. And so we're going to take a look at the mistakes of other people in order that we may follow the good and that we may, we may shun the evil. I'm going to hold up two men. They knew one another. Both of these men were kings of Israel. The first king of Israel was a man, a very handsome man, a tremendous physique, a very uh, impressive fellow, intelligent and strong physically, and his name was Saul. And we're going to notice from the Bible that he committed the unpardonable sin. Let's see how his early experience was. I'm going to turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 10. I'm going to hold up the picture of a man who is obviously filled with the Holy Spirit of God. When he was anointed king over Israel, 1 Samuel 10, 6, the record is as follows. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and you shall prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. Now we know that the gift of prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, don't we? Find that in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Spirit of God came upon Saul with such fullness that he was a prophet. The record says that he was turned into another man. And what does that mean in the light of the New Testament? It means that he was certainly converted. He was a new person. Let me read verse 9. And it was so. And when he had turned his back, Saul turned his back, to go away from Samuel, God gave him another heart. What's that? That's conversion again, isn't it? And all of those signs came to pass that day. And when they came near to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. I think you'll agree that it would be difficult to read in the Bible and a story that any more clearly tells about a man who was converted. Filled with the Holy Spirit, a prophet in his own right, a new heart, a new man. Certainly, Saul had the Holy Spirit. Now that's in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now I'm going to turn just six chapters later to the 16th chapter and read as follows in verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now the Spirit left him. The Spirit of God that gave him even the gift of prophecy in chapter 10 left him in chapter 16, and he was a lost man. Don't tell me that a man can't be converted and then lose his redemption. Here is a classic case. But now why? Why did the Holy Spirit leave Saul? The record of why he left him is in chapter 15. And I want to read quite a few verses here, and I think that you will get the picture. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3, an order from the Lord came to the prophet Samuel, and Samuel delivered it to the king as follows. Now go and smite Amalek. Amalek was a tribe of very, very wicked people. 
and utterly destroy them all. Everything they have, spare, spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. That was God's order. It was categorical. Destroy every Amalekite and destroy everything they have. Now the order is clear, even though we may have questions about the order that I can't go into tonight, at least at this, at this time. Now, Saul set out. He started. He started out. And he attacked the Amalekites. And he did almost everything that the Lord said. Verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag. Agag was the king. He left him alive. Now the Lord said, leave nothing alive, and least of all the king. But I suppose that this appealed to, Paul, appealed to Saul's ego. He had the king in his hand. My, look at me. I've got the king. Let's go a little further. Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and everything that was good. And they would not utterly destroy them. You see? They went contrary to the order of the Lord, right? Now, Saul returned from the battle. And whom did he meet? He met Samuel, the prophet. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, and listen to the pious language, Blessed be thou the Lord. Praise the Lord, he said. Real pious. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What does this mean, this bleating of sheep that I hear, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? What does this mean? And Saul said, Well, they've they brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord. And the rest of them, the poorer ones, we've, of course, we've destroyed them. And then Samuel said to Saul, stay, wait, and I will tell you what the Lord has told me this night. And he said to him, say on. He was still pretty arrogant. And Samuel said, When you were small in your own eyes, you were made head of the tribes of Israel, and God anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why, therefore, did you not obey the voice of the Lord? But you did fly upon the spoil." You kept the best. You did evil in the sight of God. And Saul said to Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the commandment of the Lord. Hmm. He still wouldn't admit what he'd done, would he? I have done it. And I've gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I brought Agag the king of Amalek, and I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil. Now, we're always as we say in today's world, passing the buck. Always, men are always blaming their wives for what they do. Wives are always blaming their husbands and it won't work. The people took of the spoil and the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things that should have been utterly destroyed, but we're going to sacrifice. We're going to sacrifice all of these animals to the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great sacrifice, great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. The Lord doesn't want your offering. He wants you to obey, he said to Saul. For rebellion, and I want to come back to the word rebellion, and I want you to listen to it carefully. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness. And I want to underscore stubbornness. As iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you from being king. That's verse 26. 
Now, let's put all this together. Saul committed the unpardonable sin. He partially obeyed. But not all, did he? That's one of the, dang the most dangerous traps that a person can fall into is believing that because we go most of the way with the Lord, just short of doing exactly what he says. And that is the road, my friends, that leads straight to the unpardonable sin. Saul partially obeyed. He didn't go all the way. Judging from this story, inasmuch as God never changes, that God expects you and me to do exactly what he says and to go all the way. Not just as far as I think I can go under my circumstances, but all the way. He obeyed most of what God asked him to do, but not all. You see, to reject part of what God asked us to do is to reject all of God. The Lord will be Lord of all or he won't be Lord at all. Now Saul said, well, we have the best of intentions. We have brought these sheep. Think how a wonderful offering this will be that we're going to take them to church. It's almost like the thief that robbed the store last night and justifies his thievery because he puts half of it in the offering tray. You wouldn't justify that, would you? Of course not. The Lord didn't want his sheep and his oxen. I'm going to give them to the Lord. I'm going to take them to church. Now, I come away from the reading of the story of Saul's unpardonable sin with this conviction that one of the easiest ways to commit the unpardonable sin is to justify disobedience with a pious religious answer. It becomes dangerous. You know, I have people say to me, well, Mr. Hoffman, uh, uh, I keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. Well, if that were in the Bible, I'd honor Sunday with you. But this expression, keep Sunday and honor the resurrection, God never told you to honor Sunday in commemoration of the resurrection. You see, it's a deeply religious excuse. We have kept the best of the sheep. But the Lord didn't accept the sheep. Did he now? We sometimes put deeply religious statements that are used as an excuse for the violation of the clear commandment of God. You cannot honor God by disobeying what he says. You can't honor him that way. How can you honor God while dishonoring what he says is holy? Pray tell. Think about it. If Saul were here tonight, he would say, don't give religious reasons for your disobedience. Obey the Lord, or his spirit will leave you. Wherefore didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? You see, the unpardonable sin is an act of disobedience, isn't it? And it may be so small that it involves just a few sheep. But it can cost eternal life, a few sheep. And Agag the king. Now, the second king of Israel was a man by the name of David, and I know you all are familiar with his story. David did not commit the unpardonable sin, but he was right on the edges of it. That's why we have to talk about him. Did David know about the unpardonable sin? Did he? He certainly did. You remember that David wrote most of the Psalms, and I read here 
in the 51st Psalm which David wrote, he said in verse 11 of Psalm 51, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Did David know about the unpardonable sin? He certainly did. He said, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. He knew about it, didn't he? Let's talk about David's moral life. David killed a man, I mentioned it a moment ago. The man's name was Uriah. He was a Hittite. He was one of the most faithful men in David's army. While Uriah was out fighting the battles of the kingdom for David, he was out fighting. He wouldn't even leave the front line. He was a very, very dedicated man. Well, he left his beautiful wife at home. And one day while she was taking a bath from the vantage point of the top of the palace, David looked over there and saw her taking a bath. And he became lustful of her. And he sent a messenger down that the king had asked her to come to the palace. And she came. And I leave you to decide what happened. But now he was so enamored of this beautiful woman that he had to justify what he, what he had done. And he wanted to make her his wife permanently. And so he had Uriah the Hittite, his most faithful man. By the way, Bathsheba became pregnant. But Uriah hadn't been home, so the child couldn't be his. And David tried to give him a leave, send him home, so that when the child was born, at least he would believe the child was his. But instead, Uriah was so conscientious about doing his duty out on the front line as a soldier that not even the thoughts of his beautiful wife would take him home. And so, when he stayed out there on the front line, and he stayed and he stayed until it was impossible for them to cover up the fact that she was with child by David, that then David had to carry the thing to the end point. And they pushed Uriah the Hittite into the front of the lines, and Uriah the Hittite was killed so that David could legitimize the thing that he had done. But one sin was compounded by another. And here was murder on top of adultery. And David was in deep water. As a matter of fact, David never regained the respect of the people of the kingdom. And as a consequence of David's action, the people of Israel went down into a slew of immorality. And David was powerless to stop it. If he opened his mouth to say, well, you people shouldn't do this, they would say, well, who are you to talk after what you did? because everybody knew. So David did a terrible, terrible thing, didn't he? And everybody knew about it, and the scandal went everywhere, and the moral bounds and the floodgates of sin were open for all of Israel. And that's the way sin is. It doesn't stay in a small package. It has the way of poisoning the lives of others. It was in the light of this terrible thing that David did that he wrote the 51st Psalm. Now, I suppose you've all read the 51st Psalm. And you read it one night just before you went to sleep. Some of you read it with ice water in your veins and you can't read it that way. I would like to read a portion of this Psalm in the spirit in which I think that David wrote it. Would you let me? Listen to this man with his heart broken over his own sins. Listen to this. Have mercy on me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me truly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against thee and against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightst be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Oh, friend, you just can't read the 51st Psalm in the light of what we know that David had done, that you realize that here is the calling of a man's heart. I've done wrong, I've done wrong, I've been wrong. You see that, don't you? He was afraid that God would take away his spirit and he'd be lost forever. Now let's compare these two kings for just a moment, shall we? Saul, David. Hmm? Let's make an imaginary visit to the town. Let's imagine in our minds that David lives over here on this corner and Saul lives over there. And we stop a man on the street as we're going along as a group of tourists and we say, uh, my, that's a lovely home. Who lives there? Oh, a man by the name of David lives there. Hmm, I think I've heard about him. Who lives over there? Well, a man by the name of Saul. Well, I think I've heard about him too. Do you know these two men? Oh, yes, I've, uh, I've known them since they were boys. What kind of man is this man, David? Oh, I can't say much good about him. He had a man killed. Took his wife. He got away with it, too. Power politics. What about this man, Saul, who lives over here across the street? What kind of man is he? Oh, he's a very decent chap. He's not at all like this man, David. He, Saul, had never killed his neighbor. And he leaves their wives alone, too. He's a religious man. Oh, when we have a service down at the church, he brings the very best animals. He gives good support to the church, I'll tell you. He goes around praising the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, he's, he talks real pious. Wish we had more men like him around. But we could sure do without people like David. He really is a plague on the society. Well, now, pardon me, neighbor. I'm not going to ask you to uh, pass judgment on these two men, but I was just wondering what you think. What chance would you give for David to be in God's kingdom? <laughs> I wouldn't give him any chance after what he did. What about Saul? Oh, he'll make it. He's a decent fellow. He really supports the church. Can you see what we're talking about here? That outwardly, David will never make it. Outwardly, as far as their moral behavior is concerned, Saul is sure to go to glory. Yet the evaluation of the neighbor looking through human eyes is completely backwards of the thoughts and the mind of God. Can you see that? And I'll tell you why. Now, this is, you see, the moral values are so different. Now, how is it that God can save David and he can't save Saul? Morally, certainly David is a far worse character. Certainly saving a few sheep is nowhere near as bad as having a man killed and committing adultery with his wife. If you're going to compare after, you know, ordinary standards, then why is it that God can save a man who does a dastardly deeds, murder and adultery, and that he rejects a man who only just a little thing, just a few sheep and a few cows? Do you know why? It's all back there in the book that we were reading just a moment ago. In 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, verse 13. And Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now let's read verse 14. And 
Samuel said, What is this bleating of the sheep and mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? What's the problem with Saul? It's not the few sheep. That's trivial. The problem, my friend, is in his attitude. He wouldn't admit that he had done anything wrong. Would he now? The unpardonable sin is in the attitude. The reason why the Spirit of God leaves a man's life or a woman's life is because their attitude is wrong. It's not what they do so much as it is in their attitude about what they do. I have done the commandment of the Lord. You see, Saul would never admit he'd done anything wrong. The Spirit of God is taken from a person that will not repent, even if it's only a few sheep. The unpardonable sin is an attitude of self-justification in wrongdoing. It's downright refusal to obey the will of the Lord. And it may involve only a few sheep. Let's look at David's attitude, and you see the difference, and why God can save David, and why the Holy Spirit did not leave David. Because he said, My sin is ever before me. Purge me. Forgive me, O God, by the multitude of thy mercies, of thy tender kindness. Forgive me. The attitude of David was that he repented. He confessed his sins. The unpardonable sin is simply a refusal to repent. Put it in that light. Let's make a last comparison between these two men. They both had sinned. What is sin? Sin is knowing what God expects of us and refusing to do it. They both had sinned, but only one would admit it. God can only save the person who will admit that he's done wrong, or he's doing wrong. Did David know about the unpardonable sin? There's another text that says he did. And this one is found in the 19th Psalm, and I think it's verse 13. Listen to this, because this gives us some help tonight. He prayed here, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. We're going to look at the word presumptuous. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. The great transgression. What is this great transgression? It's the unpardonable sin. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Keep me from being presumptuous. Keep me from being in presumptuous sin. That's the way he prayed. What is presumptuous sin anyway? What is presumption? The word you don't use very, day, very every day. Presumption is like this. I don't think that under these conditions that God will hold me responsible. Under these conditions, I can do this because I don't think that God really cares. Let me tell you about a man. This man was working in the, one of the defense industries during World War II. And every night as he left the plant, he reached into a keg and got a handful of copper rivets. And he put the copper ri a handful in this pocket. And he reached over and he got a handful and he put, it in, put them in this pocket. He walked out of the plant every night with his pockets literally loaded with copper rivets. And when he was finally caught, he said, yes, I took them because I think that I am underpaid. Now, 
Now, what does that mean? That's presumption. Because those rivets did not belong to him, it was stealing, wasn't it now? If he thought he was underpaid, he should have done something else besides steal. But he justified his thievery. This was a presumptuous sin. I don't think God will hold me responsible for walking out with my pockets full of rivets because God himself knows that I'm underpaid. That's presumption. That under these conditions, I don't think God really cares. Let me give you another story. And this one, I'm not going to elaborate. I'm not going to elaborate on this story. But the story is like this. I had a man tell me one time, when I found that he had been, he had been trifling, he had been seeing a woman who was not his wife, one he was caught up with. He said, I don't think that under these conditions that God holds me responsible. My wife is cold. And that's presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin that David talks here, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins, that under these conditions I don't think God expects this of me. I don't think it's wrong because of one, two, three. This is a rationalization, you see. That's presumptuous sin. You wouldn't do that, would you? I have folks say to me, well, I don't think, Mr. Hoffman, that I know that the seventh day is Saturday, but everybody's keeping Sunday, and I don't think that under these conditions God expects this of me. Yea, I have obeyed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, you have broken the commandment of the Lord. Why don't you obey? It's easy for the trick of the human mind to excuse our foibles and excuse our disobedience with the shelter of under these conditions. And God doesn't accept that. That's a presumptuous sin. We'll look into another one of those in just a little bit. Now it's obvious, as we look at another section of our thoughts here tonight, it is obvious that the sin against uh, the Holy Spirit, there's the word sin, and the words, uh, there is the Holy Spirit. That you, the sin against the Holy Spirit cannot be separated from the Holy Spirit. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? I read what Jesus said, that he, he promised that he would send the Holy Spirit, and his work would be, his work would be to convince the world of sin. And when he is come, this is John 16 and 8, when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin. He'll say, that's wrong. Well, now, nobody likes to be told he's wrong. The work of the Holy Spirit is to say, that's wrong. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, we're dealing with the Bible here. What is sin? I'm going to bring to your attention just two or three quick texts, and this is just all I think that, we'll, that we will need. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convince us that we're doing wrong, that we've sinned. Over here in 1 John, third chapter, there is the, de the clearest definition of sin that I think I could bring to you. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. The sin against the Holy Spirit, and sin is the transgression of the law, the, ho the, the sin against the Holy Spirit is transgressing the law of the Holy Spirit. He says, now this is wrong. And you say, no, I don't think so. Not under these conditions. And we sidestep. Under these conditions that I've only brought a few sheep, and I'm going to give them to the church anyway, makes it right. Doesn't make it right. No matter how sanctimonious it might appear, he will convince the world of sin. The Apostle Paul says in, in Romans 4 and 15, by the law is the knowledge of sin. You read in Romans 7, he said, yea, I had not known sin, but by the law. I had not known lust, except the law has said, thou shalt not covet. 
He said, I wouldn't know right from wrong. I wouldn't know I'd done any wrong, except the law told me. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit uses the law of God as a sharp sword, because the word of God is a two-edged sword, and a sword cuts. And the word of God, the Spirit of God, takes this sword, and he puts it right in, and it hurts when he says, now look, you didn't tell the truth. And he reproves, he rebukes you for not telling the truth. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He says to you, look, you took this and it is not yours. He takes the law and he reproves of sin and sin is the violation of law. That's what the Bible says, all the way through. Why don't you obey? The Lord of the word of the Lord came and you didn't do it. That was the will of God. Let's look at a couple of examples for this. Some of the examples I find here in the Bible are most striking, and it gives us an insight into the mind of God in regard to these matters. There's a story told over in the book of Daniel, two of them that I'm going to tell you tonight. There's a story told about three men who went into a fiery furnace, and they were not burned up, remember? And the men who had stoked these fellows into the furnace stood afar off. Some of them were burned. Some of them died putting them in, as a matter of fact. And there were people who stood off and said, did we only put three men in there? There are four. And the fourth one was the Lord Jesus there with them in the fire. But now why did they get into the fire? It happened that the king, the king had made a great statue, a great image. It was an idolatrous action. He had made this great image and put it on the plains of Dura. All of the ruling class of the kingdom of Babylon were there for this occasion to honor the king. And he was going to show off his great statue that he had made. We can't comment on that too much, but let's just leave it there. It happens that these three men were Hebrews, and the second commandment said, Thou shalt not make any graven image, thou shalt not bow thyself, bow, meaning the bow, you shall not bow or bow thyself to them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now the king had some musicians there, and they were to blow the trumpets and sound the music, and the king pronounced, he said, when the trumpets blow, everybody bows down before the image. And so the trumpets blew, and everybody bowed down, except the three. And here they were, standing tall. It's kind of embarrassing, isn't it, to be conspicuous? The king came over. He was very kind. He said, apparently, you men didn't get the message. That when the music plays, that you bow down, we'll give you one more chance. And they respectfully said, Your Highness, we understood the order on the first count. And we respectfully honor you as the king, but we can't bow down. Why? Because the second commandment of the Ted said no. This was the will of God. This was the law of God. Now, why didn't they have a little whispering campaign between them and say, well, now, uh, under these conditions, after all, it's embarrassing to be standing while everybody's kneeling, and under these conditions, really, we know that this statue doesn't mean anything, and I think that God knows our hearts. Why didn't they have a little whispering caucus between them and go ahead and bow down? God isn't going to care not under these circumstances. And why is that story told to us? Because if these men bowed down, knowing full well what they knew, that it was the will of God for them that they were not to bow to anything made of any substance, of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth, it would have been a presumptuous action and would have led them to the unpardonable sin. Isn't that what we have this story for? 
These stories, my friends, are not in the Bible to amuse the children. About fire in the furnace. The moral object lesson is that the men do not bow, and we don't bow under any circumstances. Because to do so is presumption. Is presumption against the clear stated will of God. And the Spirit of God will lead, leave us under these conditions. So they couldn't bow. And this is to guide us today. This is the Christian's guidebook. But it's pitifully little in the way of Christian character that you see. Oh, it's easy to go to church with the crowd. It's embarrassing to stand when everybody's bowing. It's pitifully little conviction that we see today. The kind of conviction that sustained the martyrs at the stake when the fires were lighted. Where is the spirit of the martyrs in today's world? That we will obey God regardless of, of what comes come hell or high water, we serve God. Now there's another story in the book of Daniel that God has put in there to guide us, to guide you folk, because you're making decisions. And if we're not guided by the word of God, what do we have? There was an order made by the king at the instigation of some people who disliked Daniel very, very much, that for a protracted period of time nobody was to, to offer any prayers to anybody except to the king because the kings were worshipped as gods. Now they knew that this would touch Daniel because Daniel had a practice that every morning and every noon and every night in his apartment he opened the double windows and he knelt before the windows looking toward Jerusalem and he prayed to the God of heaven who made the heavens and the earth. Now, what would Daniel do when he heard about the law that nobody was to pray except to the king? He could have said to himself, well, now listen, under these circumstances, I'll pray in private where they can't see me. And I'll just keep the windows closed and that will save me a bundle of trouble. I don't want to get into any hassle about this matter. But he didn't take that position. As was his custom, he opened the windows, and in the morning he prayed, and at noon he prayed, and I suppose by nightfall they had him. They had him tied up tight. It was brought to the attention of the king that Daniel had done his prayers as usual. And the king was brokenhearted because he valued the integrity of this man. Why didn't Daniel close the window? Why didn't he forbear and say, Now the Lord knows my heart. He knows that I, I've got to do this thing for a little while, and when they relax this thing, I'll come back to praying as I usually do. But I don't want to get into trouble. Do you know why? Why? Because the first commandment said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. To respect the order of the king was to disobey the first commandment. And under no circumstances, not even under these conditions, could he so much as close the window, because to close the window would be to deny the God he served. That's what I read in the Bible. These are the things that you folks know, don't you? If your lives are not guided by these principles, pray tell, what are you going to do? What principles are you going to be guided by? What values are by which are you going to structure your lives? You know that, that Daniel went into the lion's den and the God of heaven shut the lion's mouths. The king came down and he looked in and he said, and it's a marvelous story. Read it before you sleep. That the voice of the king spoke down into the den and said, Daniel, 
Is the God whom you serve continually able to deliver you out of the lion's mouth? And the Daniel spoke and said, O king, live forever. The Lord God has sent his angel and has closed the lion's mouth. You know, the fact that the king went there and asked the question was indication that there was something planted even in the heart of the monarch. A little bit of faith in Daniel's God. I don't know whether Daniel knew it was there to start out with. But the fact that he came and spoke and said, Daniel, is your God able? That would be silly ordinarily to go and ask such a question. But he went because he knew Daniel's faith not under any circumstances do we violate the first commandment. Under no circumstances, even if it's a lion's den or a fiery furnace, do we violate the second commandment. And it's only people, ladies and gentlemen, who have that kind of principles about the fourth commandment that will not commit the unpardonable sin. because we can't be bought and we can't be sold regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how many of the crowd bows, regardless of how conspicuous it is to stand free in the middle of the crowd. Let's stand. These are the guidelines that we have here in the Word of God. In the New Testament, just one story. We come to the end of the message tonight. It's in the book of Acts. The story of Ananias and Sapphira, and I read a little bit of it the other night, and I think you know the story. The story of Ananias and Sapphira, how that they sold a piece of property, and they said that they had brought all of the money, but they hadn't. It's in the fifth chapter of Acts. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And they kept back part of the price, held it in their pocket. His wife also was party to it. And they brought back, they brought some of the money and they laid it at the apostles' feet. They, most of it, as you notice here in verse 2 of Acts 5, they brought back, they brought most of it. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? To keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, it wasn't it yours. And after it was sold, it wasn't it in your power. Why do you conceive this thing in your heart? Why, you haven't lied to men but unto God. And the record says, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. In great fear came all them that heard these things. And the young men rose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. Why? He had lied to the Holy Spirit. He had stolen, hadn't he? And the law of God had said, Thou shalt not steal. He had lied, and the law of God had said, Thou shalt not bear false witness. And they carried him out dead and they buried him. He committed the unpardonable sin. Over what? Over, over the Eighth Commandment and over the Ninth. You see, here is the question, here is the story of failure. While the story of Daniel and the story of the three Hebrews is a story of success because they knew the difference, that they were not under any circumstances to sin or to lie against the Holy Spirit of God. I remember a lady attending some meetings. The minister was working with her. She'd been listening to the Ten Commandments. This is what sin is. And uh, she, she said, I'm never going to keep the Sabbath. She said, if God is going to save me, he's got to save me some other way. And her husband apparently had more insight than she had. And he turned to her and he said, Mother, that's presumption. And he was absolutely right. That's presumption. It is presumption to believe that we can stand in defiance of the Ten Commandment law of God, which is the law of the government of his kingdom, and still think we're citizens and still think that when the gates of the pearl, the gates of pearl of the great city of the kingdom of our God, that we can go in 
thinking that under these circumstances it doesn't make any difference. We would be positively dangerous to take into the kingdom of God because the seeds of our own presumption would only start the program of sin all over again. Everybody would start excusing a few sheep. Excusing, oh, just one little bow down won't really matter. One little window closed, just a few dollars in our pocket, we gave most of it. And if God were to let such a person who presum presumes to violate his commandments believing that under these conditions it's all right, he can't do that because if he did, he would only jeopardize the safety of the universe and we've already had enough. The Apostle Paul caps it off when he said in the book of Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 26, one of the most powerful texts in the New Testament. You must listen carefully. If you would avoid the unpardonable sin, you must pay careful attention. If we sin willfully, after we receive a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries if we go on sinning full well knowing after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there isn't any sacrifice for sins. The blood of Christ will not cover presumptuous sins. We know better. To go on violating the will of God after knowing better, there is no blood of the cross to cover that, is what Paul says. Now let's return to our text, which was the ground of our message tonight, and look at it for the last time. What was the setting of Matthew, the 12th chapter? To read it again, I want to call your attention to the circumstances in which our Lord made that statement about the unpardonable sin. Verse 22 of chapter 12, there was brought to him a man who was possessed with a devil. He was blind, he was dumb, Jesus healed the man. Insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw, and all these people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? And when the Pharisees heard it, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Let's make a little comment here, shall we? Here was a man that was possessed with the devil. Jesus cast the devil out of the man. The man couldn't see. The man couldn't speak. And here was an obvious miracle, wasn't it now? You look down through the ministry of the Lord and you find that he took the very hardest cases. People that were the sickest of all. They were the ones that Jesus worked with. Jesus healed a man that was born blind. Now why did he choose that particular man? Because he didn't want anybody going around saying, well... This was just a natural thing. He was blind temporarily and he just happened to get his sight while Jesus was standing there. And, but that's nothing. That proves nothing. But Jesus took the man that was born blind. Jesus took a man that was a cripple for 28 years and that everybody as they made their way to the temple stumbled over this man and the Lord healed him. He cured the worst question, the worst cases, so that there wouldn't be any question. Now listen. There was no question about this that the enemies of Jesus were convinced. There, there, he just didn't leave any, any room for lack of conviction. The enemies of Jesus, while they were convinced, they didn't want to accept. Because it's one thing to believe, another thing to do. 
Now, who were these enemies of Jesus who wanted him dead, as you'll go on to see? They were not people who lived a degraded life. They were the Pharisees. They went every day to the temple to pray. They fasted twice in the week. They paid their tithe. They were the most loyal religious supporters. They were deeply religious people to whom Jesus gave the warning about the sin against the Holy Spirit. It becomes obvious that religion and a deep religious devotion is no protection against this sin. As a matter of fact, in some ways it may be a hazard. A degraded man knows that he ought to change. I have never met as yet an alcoholic who didn't want to stop drinking. But these people were not drunkards. I have never met a thief who didn't know that he was doing wrong. He said, I know I shouldn't do this. You see, if a man is committing some heinous sin, he, he, he knows he's done wrong. And these people, they weren't doing anything outwardly very bad. And they were convinced that Jesus was the right person but they didn't want to accept him. And God is telling us something here, that religious people are often in a very dangerous position. What had these people done that was so dangerous that he would warn them about this sin? They had hardened their hearts to the truth. Jesus said, When he which is the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. The work of the Spirit is to guide into truth. Jesus said, Thy word is truth. David said, All thy commandments are truth. Now the work of the Spirit is to guide us into the truth. And if we see what is true, and we refuse to be guided by it, at the point at which we separate from what we know to be truth, at that point we separate from the spirit of truth because the two always are together. It's a dangerous thing, ladies and gentlemen, to come to meetings like this and to learn what is truth. Because truth will do one of two things. It will save us for God's kingdom by the grace of Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth. You can't turn away from truth without turning away from Jesus who is the truth. You can't turn away from truth without turning away from the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth. It's a dangerous thing to come to meetings like this and learn the truth. Because the truth will haunt you as long as you live. It will either become within you a guideline, a way of life. The truth will cause you to stand amidst the crowd that you cannot bow. The truth will sometimes put you in a lion's den but God will be there to shut the lion's mouth. The truth will sometimes put you in a fiery furnace, but when you get in there, you'll find that Christ is there with you. It's a dangerous thing to know the truth because it will either save or it will condemn because the truth will out. And the truth will find you guilty or the truth will find you just. So that when we receive the truth, we receive the spirit of truth. And when we reject the truth, in that one instance, we reject the spirit of truth because they're always together. And we reject the Lord of truth because you can't separate them either. As a closing summary, what is this sin? It is like the scribes and the Pharisees. It is to reject clear and convincing evidence. It is the failure to do exactly what God says, not even a few sheep. It is rejecting the truth of God and in the package rejecting the Spirit of God. The unpardonable sin is making excuses to cover up our disobedience. I've saved them, I'm going to take them to church. The unpardonable sin is closing our eyes. Having eyes but seeing not, Jesus said. Having ears but hearing not. Closing our eyes because we don't want to see. 
It's holding our hands over our ears so that we cannot hear. The unpardonable sin is knowing the will of God and refusing to obey it. What is this bleating of sheep? What is the unpardonable sin? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. The unpardonable sin is rebellion. It's saying, I know what you want of me, but I'm not going to. And stubbornness. What is the unpardonable sin? It's rebellion. It's stubbornness. And finally, to use one word that characterizes the unpardonable sin, ultimately, it results in indifference. I recall a lady who said, you know, I once was, uh, it greatly disturbed me, the Sabbath question. I was really bothered by it, but I'm not bothered by it anymore. It doesn't bother me. It broke my heart to hear her say that. Because the unpardonable sin is knowing the law of God and refusing to follow, becoming insensitive and indifferent. It's seeing with our own eyes the evidence of the power of truth and thinking that we can live without it. It's knowing God's will and not walking in it. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we have meditated tonight, O Lord, in thy presence and in the presence of thy Spirit who has been here and in the presence of the holy angels who have observed and written in the record the attitudes, the spirit, the thoughts, of every one of us. What a solemn thing to know that we shall give an account for every, even the idle words and even the thoughts and meditations of our hearts. Oh Lord, tonight, help us. We walk on the edges, the sharp dividing line between heaven and loss between salvation and, and death. Lord, we've been here together many, many nights. We can pray more intelligently now than we ever have been able to before. Now that we've learned so much that is true. Oh Lord, come thou by thy Spirit into our lives and touch these hearts of ours that we are willing to accept the clear evidence. Keep us, O oh God, from presumptuous sins, excusing ourselves by some self-conviction when we lie to ourselves and comfort ourselves that we're all right when we're not. Help us, Lord. Bless every dear family that's been so faithful to listen to thy word, that when the crowds that the 5,000 are gone. May we be, O oh God, amongst those who are still standing at the foot of the cross and loyal to Jesus. Now, dear hearts, while your heads are bowed, I believe it would be pleasing to our God tonight that we come at this last evening service and we give him ourselves. He can lay a claim to us only because he never did anything that he did. He never asked of us anything that he didn't do. He asked you to give yourself fully to him. Nothing held back. No reservations. Because he gave himself. He had nothing that he withheld. He had no house, no pillow to put his head on. He gave up even his clothes and they gambled over them. 
he went down to the last stitch, holding nothing back that he might be able to lay claim upon every one of us here. That's the meaning of the cross. That's what it means to accept the cross. The cross is not a piece of metal you put around your neck on a chain. The cross is a commitment. The cross is a canceled eye. Not my will, but thine be done. The cross is a way of living in which we say, as Jesus said, if it will benefit you, I'll gladly give of myself because I love you. And I'm going to ask you tonight, in the light of that cross, in the light of his claim, you give yourself to him. He loves you. And I care about you. I wouldn't be a minister after God's order if I weren't on my knees praying for you, mentioning your names in prayer. And I've cried out and I've pled to God, Oh, Lord, don't let these precious hearts go astray. Save them, dear God, in a time when the world is all going an immoral way and law and order mean nothing. I've prayed for you. My heart is tender toward you. And if I, being an evil man, can feel about you, dear hearts, as I do, how much more shall the God of all righteousness feel about you so much the more? And it's he that's calling you tonight. Come to him. While our organist plays just a little soft music, just softly, I'm going to ask you to come tonight for this consecration prayer at the close. I'm going to meet you here. I'm coming down from this pulpit. The minister has no lease on eternal life. He's no higher than the people. It's only for purposes of convenience that we're here. But when it comes to our redemption, we're all on the same level. I hold no lease on eternal life. My sins, too, must be forgiven. My heart, too, must be consecrated and surrendered. I must give of my hands and my feet as my Lord gave his. I must give of my mind as he gave his and he bled from his brow. I must give from my heart because he bled from his side. I must give him of my service because he bled from his hands. And I must go where he sends me because he bled from his feet. And the same claims that he makes upon me, he makes upon you. In the name of Jesus, the Lord of Calvary, come to him quietly tonight. And tell him, Lord, here am I. I'm yours. Come. Come.